started. Okay, so I am going to turn this over to Dr. Stephen Pitt for joining. Hi, I am uh, Stephen Hicks. Thanks for that uh, uh, introduction, Vicky, and also thanks for setting all of this up. Uh, it was a larger amount of work behind the behind the scenes. My role today is uh, to moderate what I think is a, a an impressive panel, a heavy hitter panel of uh, thoughtful individuals. We have a philosopher, an economist, and a psychologist, and uh, we'll have a very thought filled ninety minute program. The uh, structure is going to be, I'm going to say a few opening remarks, uh, exercising moderator privilege, and then for the most part, I'm going to uh, try to shut up as much as possible and uh, then give each of our speakers 10 minutes to uh, go over their prepared marks, remarks rather. At the end of that, uh, each of them will have five minutes to respond to the remarks that the others have made. And then we have a substantial amount of time for audience Q&A. So as uh, Dr. Odino mentioned, please do put your questions in the chat box and if possible, direct them to uh, a particular individual who provoked right, that thought. Or of course, if you have a general question, uh, that is also fine. Part of my job as moderator is I will be monitoring the uh, chat box and I'll uh, select the questions and I will deliver them to the participants. Uh, in some cases, indulge me if there are overlapping questions, I might massage them together or combine a couple of questions. So uh, be prepared that exactly your wording might not be what, what comes out. And then at the end of that, we'll have a few minutes for uh, some concluding remarks. Uh, this is a dark topic, uh, but I do hope that we also will have some positive agenda items, what we can do to, uh, to confront authoritarianism, which does seem to be a, a persistent problem. Now we have four questions when we were talking this over uh, beforehand that were guiding our thinking. The first, of course, is uh, you know what exactly is authoritarianism? What do we mean by that? Uh, we might say I'm the author of my own life or God is the author of, uh, of the universe or the great book of the universe. And we might uh, describe our parents or our bosses as uh, acting in an authoritarian fashion. And all of those are legitimate uses, sometimes metaphorical. But our conversation today will mostly be focused on political authoritarianism. What, what is that? How does it uh, you know, contrast to all of the other isms that we use when we are talking in a political context? Uh, uh, is authoritarianism a problem? And of course, you know, from our perspective, 1% of authoritarianism is a, is a problem. But is it a, is it a big problem? Is it a medium-sized problem? Is it merely a matter of you know, a few noisy voices amplified by social media? Is it some trends that we are, uh, that are in fact happening and perhaps are worrisome, but they are things that we've confronted before and the, uh, the reaction and the, and, and the arguments and other actions against it are, are being mobilized and we can handle it. So how big a threat is authoritarianism, whatever we mean by that? And uh, and how do we know that it's, it's a threat that side? Is there data that we can, we can look at? A uh, further question on our mind is the question of uh, why authoritarianism is a problem, uh, particularly those of us who are well-informed. And it seems like people in the 21st century in one sense are better educated. We have more literate people with more access to media sources. And after the experience, particularly of the 20th century, the great battles against uh, fascist authoritarianism, national socialist authoritarianism, com communist authoritarianism, we just went through these huge battles. Why is it even an issue? Why haven't we, we learned the lesson? And then of course, prior to that, we had the centuries long uh, kind of feudal authoritarianism where we were supposed to do whatever the king says or religious authoritarianism and so on. So it seems like, We've been fighting this battle for not many decades, but many centuries, and it seems like we should should uh, should be uh, be further along. So why is it a, a problem? And perhaps, of course, part of the, uh, the, uh, the the solution is that we are fighting last century's authoritarianism or last millennia's authoritarianism, and authoritarianism has muted into new forms, perhaps pragmatic forms or populist forms or whatever other kind of adjective that we need to, to consider. 
Are the sources philosophical? Uh, we, of course, are smart beings and we live out what we think. Uh, so do we have broad uh, numbers of people committed to philosophically authoritarian ideas? Is there something embedded in the human psychology naturalistically or natively that every generation we are going to have to have to confront? Is it simply a matter of uh, uh, politicians giving them an inch and they will take a hundred miles and there's a kind of a ratchet effect that's going on in, in political dynamics? Uh, so what exactly is the best explanation or set of explanations for, for this phenomenon? And then proper uh, uh, solutions to the problem. We want uh, not to become more authoritarian uh, what do we do about that? Uh, you know, proper, proper solutions require proper diagnosis in the first place, but hopefully within an hour or so, we'll have some sharper ideas about what it is that we can do as intellectuals, as activists, as people uh, running businesses, raising our families, whatever it is that we are doing in our lives to, uh, to better confront the problem. Our host today is uh, the Atlas Society, which is a philosophical or, uh, organization. We take seriously the idea that ideas matter, particularly philosophical ideas matter, that as human beings individually, we think about our lives as a whole, we think about uh, the, the big picture context as a whole, we want our lives to be meaningful and significant and focused on the big values. And that takes us into the territory of philosophy and what we come to believe then we live and uh, unless we are hypocritical, uh, in which case we feel guilty about not living <laughs> up to our ideals, but nonetheless, philosophy then is, is inescapable. And one of the things that seems to be uh, a characteristic, particularly of the post enlightenment world is how principled we are. We're well aware of the importance of economic ideas and political ideas and scientific ideas and technological ideas. And we're looking for a philosophy that integrates all of those. And it does seem that our experience, uh, especially with respect to liberalism in the broad sense compared to contrasted to authoritarianism has been a, a philosophical battle over the nature of power and the ultimate meaning of life, religious authoritarians and feudal authoritarians. And communism was a well worked out philosophy as was national socialism and as was fascism. We are in philosophical territory. And then I'm reminded by a couple of quotations, one from uh, Lord Bolingbroke writing in the, in the 19th century who said, the really history is just philosophy teaching by example. And I love that quotation, right? So uh, we come up with philosophies and there's lots of different philosophies. And as those are adopted by the smart people of various uh, generations and then uh, inspiring politicians of various generations and other movers and shakers, that's what we get in the next, in the next generations. And uh, Ayn Rand in the 20th century uh, argued, I'll read the quotation. This is from For the New Intellectual. Just as a man's actions are preceded and determined by some form of idea in his mind. So a society's existential conditions are preceded and determined by the ascendancy of a certain philosophy among those whose job it is to deal with ideas. The events of any given period of history are the result of the thinking of the preceding period. So, uh, if that is true as a philosophical statement about human action and human social action, what does that imply for the rise of authoritarian ideas? Where did they come from and I, authoritarian practice and what are the better liberal ideas in the best sense uh, and how do we defend those? All right, I'm going to turn now to our, uh, our heavyweight panel um, and uh, all three of them are intellectuals in the best sense. I have high regard for all of them, all the published authors and accomplished, uh, accomplished individuals. Jay Friedenberg is a psychologist, PhD from the University of Virginia. Uh, Richard Salzman is an economist, PhD from Duke University where he is a professor now. David Kelly is a philosopher, PhD from Princeton University and uh, founder of our host, the Atlas Society. So welcome, gentlemen. I'm going to uh, uh, introduce you in the order I just went through. Jay will be speaking first, Richard second, and then David Kelly. Am I correct about that? 
Uh, actually, no, let me uh, say, I think we agreed that David is going to speak second, so I'll take that back. But at this point, please, Jay uh, Friedenberg, uh, the mic is yours, and I understand you have a PowerPoint. We'll give Jay a moment to, to get himself set up. Okay, everybody, well, please welcome to, uh, to the show here. And I'm gonna give myself just a second to set up the PowerPoint and then, uh, then we can get going. So I will share my screen. Okay, and it looks like this should be viewable at this point. So we're gonna enlarge. Yep, successful here. Looks good, Jay. Okay, so is that full screen? Can everybody see that? Like it should be occupying at least most of the screen. Yeah, okay, fantastic. Okay, guys, uh, welcome everybody. I'm glad we have such a large uh, attend a number of attendees to this session. I think the topic is very relevant to what is going on in uh, contemporary times in this country and around the world. Um, I'm very happy I was uh, that we have, uh, again, our esteemed colleagues here to be able to join and contribute to this conversation. I'm gonna start off with the psychological perspective on things. So what we were looking at here is objectivism versus authoritarianism of the left and the right. And I will be giving a psychological as opposed to a uh, philosophical or economic perspective, which you will be hearing later from Richard and David. So as you heard from, uh, as you heard from Stephen, we're gonna address four primary questions here. The first of these is what is authoritarianism? And there are several key features to this. The first and the most primary of which is the worship of the tribe over the individual, okay? So on the left side of the political spectrum, the tribe means something different. It includes things like race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, Whereas for the right, what constitutes our group or tribe can, it varies and we're often um, centers around the leader, the political group, or the nation. Um, in both cases, there's a favor of control over freedom. Both of these groups uh, have a desire to attain power and to exert control and power over others. Um, and this is both in the intellectual realm of ideas, but also in the material realm of economics and, and capital. Um, another characteristic here is that both seek to concentrate their power uh, rather than see it distributed. So we know that in a classical liberal, objectivist, libertarian order, the idea is that you have a pluralist society with uh, uh, dis competing centers of power and authoritarianism is sort of in direct opposition, opposition to this. It wants to see the amalgamation uh, and concentration of power. Um, if we look at Gessen uh, in 2020, uh, there, she argues that there is what is called the authoritarian playbook. And what she means by this is that there are four key things that authoritarians tend to go by and by which you can characterize and identify them. Um, they, are, they use patriotism, conspiracy, scapegoating, and nostalgia. And what she means by that is that they appeal to a sense of nationalism, okay? Number one, the country is great, we're the best country. Uh, they sell a lie, in other words, there's a disregard for truth, science, and so forth, um, and the cre creation of an alternative reality. There's this notion of blaming someone or some other group for the nation's problems. It's the immigrants, it's, it's somebody else. It's always a mis it's sort of like a, a misdirection effect of where the blame is for what's going on right now. And then there's also an attempt to go back to a time when things were supposedly better. Uh, this idea of a golden age in our past, which, we, which no one ever seems to identify clearly, um, and which we would like to get back to uh, from where we are now. Um, so, looking at authoritarianism on the left and the right, one of Rand's key insights was actually that they are not so far different. So, um, what she said is that the left and the right are really like two rival gangs that are fighting over 
the same territory. In other words, they're both variants of statism or collectivism in which individuals are slaves to the state. Um, and so Rand said this, of course, many decades ago, but this has been echoed by contemporary scholars, both Applebaum and Magyar in recent works have echoed uh, similar sentiments. Um, and they also contribute this other uh, really uh, interesting idea, which is that unlike the authoritarians of the past, which were ideological, so if we look at communism, it was based in Marxist philosophy. If we look at, the, if we look at fascism and Nazis, that was, they had a basis in philosophy and ideology. But today's authoritarians have no ideology. They don't, they don't, they're not principled, they're not philosophical. Uh, they are basically can be viewed as a mechanism for maintaining state power. Um, what they care about is power, uh, attaining it, holding onto it, and, and using it. And we can see this uh, well characterized in some of the post communist mafia states that were once controlled by the uh, former Soviet Union. So to go to question number two, is authoritarianism a problem? Well, I would say most definitely yes, and I think most objectivists would agree. Um, if we look at the past several years, we see that far-right autocrats have been seeking to undermine classical liberal and Western traditions. Um, and to quote, they are against things like representative democracy, uh, religious tolerance, independent judiciaries, a free press, economic integration and international uh, uh, coalitions, for example, uh, things like NAFTA. Um, and what is disturbing is to see that this type of authoritarianism is not solely uh, sort of um, taking place in Eastern European nations or former Soviet nations, but in Western and very traditional and traditionally liberal uh, nations. So we see examples in Poland, in Hungary. Hungary is probably on the verge of totalitarianism right now. Um, but we see uh, hints of it, of course, also in the United Kingdom and the United States. So from a psychological perspective, how is it that we explain the rise and the appeal of authoritarianism? And as a psychologist, I'm gonna look at this from a number of perspectives, including neuroscience, evolutionary psychology, um, and regular sort of clinical psychology. So to look at the clinical perspective first, we see that there is evidence for, some, uh, for something called the authoritarian, what, what Applebaum calls the authoritarian mindset. Um, and this is characterized by favoring homogeneity and order. Um, but on the other end of this continuum, we can see also per certain personalities that predispose one towards libertarian leanings. Um, these are people who uh, like plural, uh, they like diversity and difference. Um, so the authoritarian personality appeals to people who have a difficulty in tolerating complexity. Um, it is anti, and this is to quote Applebaum, it is anti-pluralist, suspicious of people with different ideas and uh, prefers not to debate. She characterizes it as a frame of mind rather than a set of ideas. Now, going to the genetics, uh, genetic basis for this, uh, it's interesting uh, that we have a variety of different genes that regulate brain states. And some, one set of genes actually uh, predisposes brains to derive pleasure from things that are novel, diverse, and, and variety. Okay, so they get like, they like that sort of stimulation that they get from a variety of different types of, 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 of stimuli. Um, these people are more open to experience and they're more predisposed to liberalism. Now I say predisposed because we're not talking about genetic determinism here. We're not saying if you have this gene, it's gonna make you a Democrat or a Republican. We're saying that these genes are likely to make a brain a certain way, which in conjunction with environment might channel somebody towards having a, a particular political preference. <clears throat> uh, on, the, on the other side of this, we see that there are genes that regulate threat sensitivity. So people who get aroused very easily when presented, for example, pictures of people from uh, another race. 
And people with these genes, uh, it, they, they might be predisposed towards more authoritarian leanings. Okay, so of course, evolution is what shapes genetics and then genetics shapes behavior. So we need to take a look at what possible role evolution can play here as well. And um, the main lesson here from evolution is the in-group and the out-group. It's my tribe and your tribe, our, us and them, what's sometimes called the other in academia. And uh, from an evolutionary perspective, we have in-group bonding, which promotes social cooperation and coordination. And of course, this has survival value, right? If you've got a group out and they're hunting and they can coordinate linguistically, uh, and they can work together good as a group, they're gonna be more successful at obtaining resources. Um, but on the other hand, outgroup hatred and fear of the other is also adaptive. You, and and uh, you know, uh, this again devolves down to scarcity of resources and competition for them. So you know, I like to give this example that if you have two tribes, you've got the Ugg tribe and the Og tribe, and they live in a valley and there's only so much, there's like, a hundred gazelle, there's only a hundred gazelle, and they you know, each group needs a hundred, then what's a simple solution to surviving? Well, you just kill the other group, okay? So in fact, war, hatred, fear, these things might have uh, a clear-cut evolutionary select, uh, selection basis. Now, I'm sure many of you have uh, read Jonathan Haidt's um, book in 2012, um, in which he uses evolutionary psychology to analyze moral behavior. This is the righteous mind. Um, and in it, he outlines five moral burdens, or I'm sorry, five moral foundations. And these are traits to which we are all very sensitive to, okay? And they are care, caring for others, fairness, is this, is this a, a good situation for me and other people? Loyalty, am I showing loyalty to the group? authority, am I showing deference to the sort of hierarchical power structure of the tribe, and sanctity, what is considered holy and, um, and, and needs to be elevated to special, uh, some special status, things like flags and, also, and, and religious uh, objects. So very interestingly enough, Haight um, says that Liberals tend to be, and this is based on some survey data that he's done, he says that the liberals are more concerned with care and fairness, which might explain their ideas about equality and redistribution, um, whereas uh, conservatives tend to be more focused on all five. And he then adds in liberty as this sixth additional uh, moral foundation uh, later and says that in fact, both groups, the left and the right, are uh, equally interested and affected by the notion of liberty. Okay. Um, I have to bring this up. I know Stephen mentioned this very briefly, but we live in a technological world and technology has played a very key role in the last election and looks to be playing a key role in this election. Of course, we've all heard about trolls, mis uh, misinformation coming from Iran and China and Russia and how that's influenced the US election. Um, so this is nothing new, but we seem to have reached a point in which technology, we are not controlling technology, but it seems like technology is now controlling us. Um, if we get onto these social media platforms like Facebook and Twitter, you may not realize it, but you are being directed towards ads that fit your interests and worse than that, the news that you read and the groups that you join are all being heavily biased and directed by these algorithms that you're interacting with online. Um, so we see that groups like Facebook and Twitter are relatively unregulated. They're not well fact-checked. Um, they tend to enhance subjective and emotional thinking. And in the way that they're operating currently is that they allow for fake news, things like fake news, misinformation, um, as we said before, state-sponsored trolling. And the result, it's very important here because what happens is that people's opinions now are more, much more divided. Uh, people buy into crazy conspiracy theories like the QAnon beliefs. Um, and, the, and 
And the software also tends to promote what's called confirmation bias, which is a belief in what you already believe. So if you believe something, evidence that supports that you're going to latch onto and you're going to, it's going to reinforce your belief very strongly. But if you see contradictory evidence that suggests that a contrary point of view might be the case, you tend to more sort of like uh, discard that and, and uh, sweep it under the rug. Okay. Um, so technology here in, is in, in contemporary times, I believe is very, is playing a very important role in biasing uh, our understanding of the news and what is truth and is also splitting us and polarizing us. So it's something that we have to talk about. We need obviously to preserve free speech on the one hand, but we have to have some way of controlling this because it poses an existential threat. Um, so I just wanna finish up here and talk very quickly about a study that was done. This is a classic study in psychology that was done by Sharif in 1961. Um, and this is, to, this is addressing the question of where, how we can reduce authoritarianism. And what Sharif did, um, and this is a study that was done with 11 year olds, he randomly assigned these children into two different groups uh, at a summer camp in Oklahoma. And the kids created names for their group. One called themselves the Eagles and the other called themselves the Rattlers, typical uh, kid names you'd expect there. And in the first phase of this experiment, what Sharif had done was he made them compete with each other, okay? So, you know, they were doing tug of war, they were in swimming competitions and so forth. And afterwards, he had these, these kids rate how, what they thought of both themselves and the other group. And the results are predictable. They thought their group was great. Um, they, they elevated their own status and they denigrated the, the other group. Um, but what Sharif did next was very telling. Okay. So he now had both of the groups cooperate together towards a common goal. Okay. So a tree would fell down and blocked a path. So we had them cut it and remove it um, and other various tasks in which they had to work together to do something that affected their, the fate and outcome of, of, the, entire, of the entire camp together. Um, and then he interviewed them after this and found that in fact, the prejudice that they felt towards the other groups was remarkably uh, reduced. It was, it was markedly reduced in this case. So the, the prejudice, the tension, and um, their negative views of the other, of the out group, had been reduced by cooperation towards a, a common goal. So, um, and this, this data has been replicated in an adult sample. It's not just true of kids. Um, and so it's something that we could utilize as a learning technique to try to maybe get ourselves to get along better and not hate each other so much. Okay, and so I just want to finally finish out here um, by mentioning things that are not exactly new, but of course, there are many ways we can save the world. The three primary ways are by education primarily, and I think some of the other people here are going to speak more fully to that, but just educating people about these types of ideas is incredibly important. Um, artistic expression, writing novels, making movies, and so forth is another way to, to, to make a big impact. People resonate emotionally to art in a way that's not, um, that gets straight uh, to them in a way that's, uh, you know, different but more powerful in some ways than, than straight out reasoning. Um, but I just want to make a few recommendations here about changing the political process. First and foremost, reducing the size and scope of government, and in particular, the executive branch, which has grown disproportionately um, in comparison to the legislative and the judicial, okay? So there are many ways that can be done. I'm just putting this out there as a, as a point. Um, number two, eliminating lobby organizations. They lead to corruption. Um, of course, there's other ways of, of getting rid of, uh, identifying and getting rid of corruption, but um, we certainly need more of it. Number three um, is unequal platforms in which political presidential candidates run on. Um, we have to level the playing field, I think, for that in terms of the amount of money people, uh, presidential candidates can use. And then finally, also things like an independent justice department, um, one that is not completely controlled by, uh, by the White House. So again, this is just one of many different uh, suggestions that, uh, for changes that can be, be made in the political realm, but education and art and other means um, certainly play uh, very powerful roles here as well. Okay, so with that, I will 
I will yield the floor mm. and allow some uh, presentations by by my other colleagues and all right, thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you, Jay. There's a lot packed into that, so uh, appreciate all of those remarks. Uh, next up will be uh, Dr. David Kelly. So, uh, David, please uh, unmute yourself, and uh, you have 10 minutes. Okay, I believe I am now unmuted. Is that true? Perfect. All right. Uh, you know, when I began thinking about this panel and working with my colleagues, I I started uh, with the question, why the term authoritarianism? I mean, why this term? Why not the rise of statism or the rise of collectivism or the rise of government, the expansion of government or whatever, any number of other terms? And as an epistemologist, I'm particularly interested in um, how concepts, how they interconnect, what the uh, underlying um, uh, structure, logical structure of the concepts is and how they relate to reality. And um, but I want to start by talking about the concept of authority, which is the root of authoritarianism. Um, authority means the right to make decisions affecting other people. And typically it means uh, with the ex expectation of their compliance. Um, it's a, a normative term. It, it's, authority is different from sheer power. Uh, which is the ability to make people do things. Um, the at least um, most this is a huge topic in political theory and political science. But it, it, it authority is understood typically as a legitimate authority, or I would say um, the uh, the power that's considered legitimate within a certain domain to make decisions for others and expect compliance. And it's not just about government. Uh, parents have authority over their children up to a certain age. Um, within an organization, um, if, you're, if, if it's well aligned, then you have uh, people who have the amount of authority they need to get the job done, their particular job within the organization. And of course, in government, um, which is unlike families and um, uh, private organizations is coercive, but the same principle applies. It's the, the, the authority exercised by the state presumably is legitimate. And that's why, um, you, you know, the state has, um, is, is granted ideally the power um, to do what it does. But, um, so it, authority is not just um, power, it's, it's legitimate power. And, um, but what makes it legitimate, and this is my one of my, my first key point, what makes it legitimate is that it's correlated with responsibility. Parents have the authority over their children because they're responsible for, for taking care of them and bringing them up um, within an organization. Um, uh, someone, call him Nick, is head of the battery division at uh, Ford. He has the authority to manage and, and allocate his budget and staff because he's responsible for delivering a good result. And I, that in principle should apply to government as well. Government has a legitimate function for sure. And um, it, its authority should be, um, should be commensurate with its responsibilities. That is, we, government should be given as much authority, but no more, than is needed to discharge the responsibilities it has. And as a classical liberal and um, libertarian uh, fan of the founding fathers, I think that's, that's pretty much what the constitution was trying to do and it did a brilliant job, um, although it did not save us from uh, the growth of government or authoritarianism. But my, my point here is I want to emphasize the link between authority and responsibilities. We'll see it. I think it has an important bearing on some of the issues here. So let me, let me go on now to authoritarianism. Um, during the Cold War, uh, and I'm thinking back in the 80s in the Reagan era, when um, the Soviet Union was still our enemy opponent, we were um, not in a hot war, but we were in a Cold War. Uh, we were also supporting various right-wing dictators um, in Egypt and elsewhere in the Middle East, Latin America, and people said, well, how come? 
and so the, uh, some of the, some people began introducing the term authoritarian. They're authoritarian. They're not totalitarian. Okay, and so that was uh, common use up to a certain point. But now totalitarianism is gone. Uh, fascist Nazi totalitarianism is long gone. The, the uh, Marxist totalitarianism, communism is, is gone. Um, and so today the uh, power structures and it, this repeats a bit of what Jay was saying. Um, they don't seek the same kind of total control that defines totalitarianism, but as extensive as it is. But also, and more importantly, as Jay also mentioned, they do not have a developed philosophy or ideology. You know, um, you know, they justify their, um, their, their rule by very pragmatic means, pragmatic arguments. It, say what you will, and as, as Stephen um, said, and can expand on it in more depth, um, say what you will about um, the fascists, they did have a philosophy. And say what you will about the Marxism, they did have a coherent set of principles, false, and the difference between them had the same results on human beings. Terrible. But you could differentiate right and left that way. Now, um, authoritarianism is usually ascribed to the right. Um, but that's a misnomer. It's partly a, mis I mean, a, a misconception. It's partly a misconception because the whole political spectrum, left-right spectrum, is incoherent. I mean, I don't know how you can have um, conservatives over on... Um, on the right, or maybe I should reverse it for you viewers, on the right, <laughs> and um, you know, liberals on the left going out to socialism, where the hell are libertarians in that? Um, both, both communism and fascism, and both right-wing so-called and left-wing authoritarianism are of a piece as against any uh, philosophy of liberty and individualism. There are differences to be sure. Um, you know, as Jay pointed out on the, on the right, the kinds of values people pursue tend to uh, emphasize order, hierarchy, um, universe, uniformity of beliefs, nationalism. On the left, it's things like, like equality, class identity, environmentalism. But these value sets really don't gel into any kind of coherent philosophy. Um, you know, the people, politicians and people pick and choose, you know, one thing from the set on the left, one thing from the set on the right. For example, um, you can have, um, you know, someone who's very environmentally oriented, but also against um, immigration because he thinks that will harm our environment. I mean, you, people mix and match these values. Uh, or again, conservatives tend to be um, more fearful right? Well, what about uh, a lot of environmentalism is driven by fear of change. I mean, in that way, the so-called liberal uh, agenda is very conservative, in a sense, uh, backward looking. So in the absence of the developed epistemologies, I, I, to me, they're all of a piece. Um, and be, in the absence of developed philosophies, what they do is rely on pragmatic, piecemeal, uh, judgments, whatever works in a situation. And that's something I want to go on and expand about. Um, is authoritarianism a problem? Um, I'm going to leave uh, this issue largely to my better informed colleagues, but I do want to say it, uh, the growth of government authority is not new. The welfare state is, is an example that has been expanding for a century and a half. And it's expanding because people are ceding their responsibility for taking care of their own health, their own children's education, their own retirement. They're ceding those things to government, which is why government now has the authority to run all the welfare state programs, Social Security, Medicare, et cetera. Um, in other words, authoritarianism can arise by popular demand, not just by a ruler seizing power. Um, and you know the, now we have the the COVID lockdown, um, which is a huge, massive expansion of government authority, 
And it's not an accident that some environmentalists are seeing this as, well, this is a trial run for the lot for the end of fossil fuels, right? If we can live with this, we can live with the Green New Deal. So I just want to end with a couple of thoughts about uh, what we can do. Um, there are lots of ideas and uh, that Jay has already raised and I know Richard will. But I think one key factor is paternalism. And the, as I said, the growth of government and of government authority over our lives began with the growth of the welfare state. And I know from my research on, uh, for a book I wrote called The a Life of One's Own, Individual Rights in the Welfare State, one of the main driving factors going back into the 19th century was fear of economic risk. Not fear of natural risk. Those have been largely reduced by progress and um, uh, prosperity. But you still had the risk of unemployment, of uh, uh, depressions, um, which were not in your control. I mean, those were um, man-made, but not subject to anyone's individual desire. So they wanted state control for that. Um, and I think that's still very much the case. And the paternalism, I mean, people just, as soon as people start giving over response, individual responsibility to anyone else, it becomes addictive. And they accommodate to it in the, in the psychological term. It, they, they, they regard that as the new normal for them. And the only question is, you know, all, all the only questions under debate are whether to expand it or not, whether to expand Obamacare, whether to um, um, uh, pass another um, stimulus bill. Um, but this, but the, the size of the government um, as it is, is, um, is kind of just taken for granted. Except for those of us who think in principles and are capable of looking outside the current state, which brings me to my last point, and that is, I think a big driver of authoritarianism is pragmatism. Pragmatism is a philosophy that was developed in the uh, early 20th century by uh, John Dewey, James, uh, 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 William James, sorry, which held that thought is, you know, just an instrument for solving problems. And that it had to be done at a concrete level. They, they did not subscribe to principles. They thought principles come and go. So they were in, in, among other things, very critical of the Constitution and constitutional barriers to government experimenting in, during the Progressive Era. And that is still very much the case. Um, you know, I'm thinking of, I live on 14th Street in Washington. It was a main route for all the protests in Washington last summer. Um, I, saw, I saw thousands of people marching down my street, chanting Black Lives Matter, no justice, no peace. And I, the crowds were so huge that I, I don't think they were all radical leftists. Um, probably a lot of really decent people. But I would ask, they were addressing a particular horror, a, a, a particular a horrific example of police brutality. Okay, police brutality is a problem. How do you solve it? Well, you, you march, you chant. Um, and I doubt any of them really um, took, very many of them took the time to go to the Black Lives um, Matter website to see what their underlying principles were. So I'm biased here as a, as a teacher of logic, but I think one of the most important things we could do is everything we can to reform education um, and introduce more rigorous um, teaching of principles as such. Thanks. All right, another uh, rich set of insights uh, squeezed into a short amount of time. Thank you for that, David. Uh, next up will be uh, Dr. Richard Salzman. Uh, 10 minutes, please. Thank you, Stephen. I thought I would start with a little historical perspective on what historically has been considered authoritative. And uh, for many years now, I've been working with students on the idea of Three, a three-part voice, if you will. So we all know what Vox Dei is. I'm, I'm, that's my the extent of my Latin, the voice of God, dominating the medieval period, followed by what I would call Vox and Talentia, the age of reason, the voice of reason. Fa fairly brief period though, right? When the US was founded, when the constitution was framed. 
but there was a counter enlightenment and it is started soon i could i would say it started with rousseau but let's say it started with hegel kant and onward um in the 1800s now what supplanted it i would say vox populi and that's the that's the uh essence of what I'm going to go with from here on uh, for, in terms of authoritarianism. Voice of the people. So if the voice of God is out, and that's what the Age of Enlightenment told us, uh, no divine right of kings, no credibility of a deity in another realm, but if then reason is kicked out of the sphere, what is the source of authority? And now the interesting part, I think, of the Age of Enlightenment was the recognition that consent of the governed was required. Okay, so that's not the problem. The problem is not consent of the governed. The idea, the problem is thinking that reason cannot tell us what should be in a constitution. Reason cannot tell us what our rights are. Reason cannot be credible and reliable and objectivity can't be credible and reliable. Well, if so, you better rely on something. And if God's out of the room, all they're left with is voice of the people. So now you start relying on a Rousseau type conception of the general will, diminishing the role of the individual. It's not the individual will anymore, it's the general will as represented by whom? By some authority figure. So um, David is absolutely right, the idea that the welfare state is a recent thing. I mean, it began with Bismarck. Bismarck in Germany in the 1870s started social insurance and unemployment insurance and what they used to call cradle to grave or womb to tomb. Uh, provisions by government and that we knew that grew and got really bad in uh, totalitarian form in the 30s. I would say even the US under FDR in the 30s flirted with fascism, not flirted with, maybe adopted it. So um, if I'm going to tie into my philosophic colleagues, it would be this idea of if reason is out the door, uh, what would the heavy reliance be on? Now, this makes me also say something which is always controversial when I say it in academia. We have to question democracy. Now, the way, by the way, the way the measures are used in poli-sci, when they measure authoritarian or autocratic regimes, they usually counter, uh, they, they counterbalance with democratic regimes. So their focus is really not on constitutionalism. What we really want is, I would call it constitutional capitalism. The founders wouldn't, but they would call it constitutionalism. And if you look in the U.S. Constitution, it says we, uh, what is it? We guarantee a Republican form of government. So the word democracy doesn't even show up in the U.S. Constitution. And the founders knew well, you know, that Socrates was killed by a democratic regime, um, that uh, Caesar was a populist who, you know, was uh, flattering the people before he got power. So they knew all that. They weren't going to fall for democracy. But demos means people. So democracy simply means rule by people. But what kind of people? Are they stupid or informed? Are they vicious or moral? And um, I, I think the problem would be if you rely increasingly on democracy, then at the same time you are dumbing down kids. Or, or I would suggest, this is Jay's category more than mine, a problem with parenting. We, we talk about safety obsessions and things like that. The whole field of parenting changed in the last 50 years from, you know, let the kids go out and play and try things and scrape their knee to this kind of bubble existence. Uh, and that's been translated into public policy. But that came out of the parenting books, believe it or not. I mean, it's not only politics. Some of it is just parenting. Demagoguery itself, when you think about it, appealing to the lowest basis interests, uh, prejudices of people. Demagoguery, same thing, comes from demos, comes from the people. So um, I think this is a big source of authoritarianism. I'm going to quote one of my favorite lines from the Federalist One. That's Hamilton, Federalist One. Those men who have overturned the liberties of republics, of them, the greatest number have begun their career by paying an obsequious court to the people, commencing demagogues and ending tyrants. So to go from a demagoguery to tyranny, you know, whether it's an authoritarian form or totalitarian form, we, I mean, we saw that in Venezuela more recently. In just 10 years, that country went from semi-free to complete chaos, um, but they were elected. Uh, uh, Chavez and Madero were elected every three or four years or so, and, and some of the more recent elections have been uh, corrupted, of course, but people voted for that. They knew what they were getting and they got uh, absolute uh, criminal behavior. Weimar Germany, we know um, that the Nazis were elected 
and they were national socialists. And even in this country, we have nationalism in Trump and on the right, and we have socialism in AOC on the left. And they had the same thing in Weimar Germany. Eventually, someone came along and said, you're both right. Nationalism and socialism are both right. Let's wed them together. And if you know the contraction, you know it's uh, Nazism. Um, a little bit more on populism. I, populism, you know, is anti-capitalist through and through, but there's left populism and right populism. And uh, the left populism tends to be anti-Wall Street, anti-unequal wealth, you know, anti-business. The populism of the, of the right, you know, we saw this a little bit in Reagan, you know, the angry taxpayer speech. So the populism you get on the right is usually of the form that government is the problem. And we might think that that would reason out to an anti-authoritarian view, but we see the Republican Party in, in America has moved toward authoritarianism. So its embrace of populism is not going to make it pro-constitutional. It's not going to make it pro-capitalist. I would actually say that the Tea Party, what was that? Is we're going on 12 years ago now? It seems like a long time ago. They were actually more interested, that group, I think, in constitutional restrictions on government. The more recent version is just whatever the people want. And notice this, here's, I think, a paradox about authority. The populism we have today under Trump, and I don't wanna place too much uh, blame on Trump. Um, notice it goes something like this. We don't trust people in authority. We don't trust the establishment. We don't trust people with credentials, people who have been in Washington a long time. Now, there's reason for that because they've so mismanaged things and so misbehaved. But it is kind of interesting because that sounds anti-authoritarian. That sounds like we people, we middle of America, you know, less educated types, less experienced, uh, no more than you guys do, no more than the experts do, no more than the credential do. And as you know, the, the establishment is pushing back. They can't stand this. Even within the Republican Party, they can't stand the idea that someone like Trump is outside the establishment. Um, but that doesn't notice show, uh, that doesn't necessarily erect a dam or a barrier against authoritarianism coming from Trump. Now, by the way, just to throw in Obama and Trump, the last two U.S. presidents, if you think about it, are relatively inexperienced, narcissistic, authoritarian, and I don't know, I, I could go on and on, but it's a really bad trend. I mean, one of the questions posed to the panel was, do I think authoritarianism or the rise of it is a problem? I do, uh, and these two recent examples, uh, seeing that it comes from both sides, so to speak, that they both, you know, they're both obsessed with just writing executive orders, you know, by decree. If I can't get anything done by legislative uh, negotiation, I'll just write a uh, executive order. Uh, Obama did that in spades and now uh, Trump has been doing that. So uh, that's a problem as well. Now, one more thing about the, the rise of democratic socialism on the left, AOC and that. How interesting, right? Because we're all, we're on this panel at least, able to remember the Cold War and then the end of the Cold War. And we thought, didn't we? We thought when the Berlin Wall fell that the reputation of socialism would never revive. It wasn't quite that they were saying capitalism won, but I mean, socialism was completely discredited, right? So why 20 years later would they slap a name democratic in front of it and make it sound better? For the same reason I'm saying this democracy thing is out of control. This idea that whatever the demos wants sanctifies it. See, that's all they've got left. All they've got left is we got a gang and is our gang bigger than yours and we got a bigger demos than you. And if we put demos in front of this awful, murderous regime called socialism, it'll somehow get whitewashed and people will vote for it. Um, I'm running out of time. I got five minutes, I think. Uh, David, really good stuff on paternalism. Um, I, I agree with you. The relationship between paternalism and the welfare state. So, so imagine this. There is a, something called political paternalism, and it is studied in poli sci. And of course, pater means father. The paternalism means fatherism. But what does that mean? It means the body politic is a family, not a group of uh, you know independent, rational individuals coming together and then deciding on a hierarchy of who will rule and who will consent to rule if it's objective rule. Paternalism, if you're talking about father or mother as the leaders, the citizens and the electorate are children, right? That, that is the model. The children, the electorate are children. 
the leaders are mom and dad. And, and I, don't, I remember I came from a Catholic family of seven kids. And anytime we wanted to do something, my father and mother reminded us that it was a dictatorship, that they would tell us what we were going to do you know, for family vacation. There was not going to be any vote on what was for dinner or what the vacation was. So um, that's what paternalism or maternalism is, if you think about it. And that totally feeds into the welfare state. The, the welfare state being this idea of, uh, what do they call it? Even the terminology, the nanny state. The nanny takes care of kids. The uh, safety net, the aversion to risk. That's what parents do, right? They cuddle us, they cradle us. They, they, if they were good parents, they would prepare us for the world and not parent us or baby us forever, right? They, their goal should be to prepare us for individual independent existence, but if they don't do it, and then they produce kids who are literally large infants, not to be to put too fine a point on it, and they start voting, you're going to get authoritarianism. You're going to get people looking for mommy and daddy in some form or another. Now, since I'm the economist here, I just wanted to give you some economic stuff if it interested any of the registrants. Um, Marxism uh, was totally discredited after the uh, after the end of World War II. And then if you know, Keynesianism, which is a kind of Marxism light, was totally discredited in the late 70s. So one curious thing you could look at today would be, why would those possibly make a comeback? Because they have, right? In 08, we got the stimulus and the bailouts and the Keynesians came back and everyone in academia that I knew uh, on the economic side, we're just shaking their heads. They could not believe there was a rehabilitation and a revival of Keynesianism. And uh, same thing with Marxism. You could say the same thing with Marxism. And, and I would say this is actually proof that my field is, all, is not all that important. That, that economics is actually the caboose, that what drives it is philosophy. And if the philosophy is moving towards statism, if the philosophy demands authoritarianism or statism, it will pick off the shelf any political economy that fits that model. And that is exactly what Marxism and Keynesianism represent. And by the way, if you know the word neoliberalism, it's a swear word in academia. Neoliberalism or the new liberalism is what academics today refer to as that period. I would date it from, I don't know, Atlas Shrugged to 2000. What, what was the movement? Toward a new kind of case for liberty. And so Rand and Friedman and Mises and Hazlitt and Reagan and Thatcher and Mulroney, that is what neoliberalism is. It isn't kind of, it isn't the kind of pure form politics you and I would want, but that trend was obviously very good. I mean, the, country, the world was moving in the right direction. Uh, it just didn't stay in that direction. But, but do know academia hates new neoliberalism. And I always remind people, liberalism does mean liberty. And how can you come out against a new form of liberty? Are you craving the old tyranny? And I think they are actually. A um, couple more things, then I'll stop. Um, the welfare state, uh, I would say, since Bismarck, is simply just getting more intensified and more virulent forms of it. You know, so if in 1965 they wanted Medicare for the elderly, what do they say now? Medicare for all. Right, so it's the same thing. It's socialized medicine by increments, by installments, but that's the direction it's moving in uh, so long as this uh, more paternalistic approach, approach is accepted. Um, the resort to emergency measures and crises, I think is another thing. Uh, that's when people are most fearful. That's what we've seen this year, right? And um, that's when the children are most afraid. Oh, it's thunder and lightning outside. Oh, there's a fire, mommy and daddy, please protect me, right? And they, and they become even more infantile. And the would-be tyrants out there, the authoritarians know it. And they either whip up these fears or they actually might be real fears. And I, I think maybe we're talking about this in 2020, precisely as David said, you see this in more intense form. The Greens are just loving this. They're seeing how maybe we can get by without flying in airplanes and, and maybe we can get by without an oil and gas industry. And hey, look at the satellite photos over Beijing. You know, there's much less pollution. I mean, these people are loving it, just loving it. And uh, what did Jane Fonda said? The, the COVID is God's gift to the left. She said that 
Is she still relevant, David? I don't know, maybe not, quoting Jane Fonda. Um, last thing I'll leave you with, I, I wrote a lot recently on Trump's resort to the Defense Production Act. And it looked a lot like uh, the, the, that act in Atlas Shrugged that gave the president complete power over the economy. The Defense Production Act from 1950 was used by Truman to basically nationalize any industry he wanted for the Korean War. They never repealed it. It permits the president to impose wage and price controls to commandeer resources. And Trump invoked it um, and to the applause of, of Nancy Pelosi and others uh, earlier this year, and it's been in, it's been used 33 times. Uh, just they're just dictates. Now make this, move that, buy this, send that. Um, if that's not authoritarianism, I don't know what is. Last thing I'll leave you with is I think um, I think the society afterwards said they would send out some suggested readings. There's something I've been working with recently called tripartite governance, and this might be another way of looking at it, that, that we think of government as politics, which of course it is, but if we, if we use the term governance, how we govern ourselves and govern our lives, I think there's three levels, personal, what I call personal, private, and public. And personal would be something like, you know, what's my, what's my toothbrush regime? Do I, do, I, do I brush my teeth three times a day? You know, the kind of personal uh, rules we go by. That's a kind of governance, right? And private governance, uh, the bylaws of a company, say, or of a, of a group. Uh, there's governance there, but then there's political governance. And I think David's absolutely right there. The distinction is that's the coercive part of it. The problem is if you think of these as spheres of governance, the public mm -hmm. governance is invading the other two. The public governance increasingly is just taking over the private governance, you know, put your mask on, wash your hands, eat your vegetables, you know, the, the kind of dictate you're getting from the political side into your private side is a further evidence of authoritarianism. So I did write an essay on that and there'll be a link to it later. So I'll stop there. I'm sorry I went over a bit there, Stephen. Okay, thanks for another uh, very rich set of comments. Uh, I am mindful of time and all three of our panelists, uh, uh, deep thinkers, all with many things to say, did go over substantially, and I do want to keep us to our 90 minutes. So in a strong authoritarian fashion, I'm going to redistribute the time available to each of you. Uh, the next portion of this program is for you, each of you to respond to the, the others, but I'm only going to give you two minutes each to make one substantial point. So uh, please uh, choose your targets wisely. Uh, Jay, you'll be up, up first. Uh, two minutes, please. There. Okay, uh, just <clears throat> unmuting my microphone there. Thank you, Stephen. Um, first, I, so I've got one remark I want to direct towards David, which is philosophical in nature, and one towards Richard, which is sort of political, economic in nature. Um, and uh, the first to David, um, you know, it, it, it's interesting. If if the founding fathers, if we, if we even were 100 years ago today in America or 150 years ago today in America, if we were discussing politics, people would be talking about Thomas Hobbes, Leviathan, they'd be talking about uh, John Locke and so forth. They would be discussing the, philosoph the philosophical foundations of politics. You ask people to talk about politics now, it has, they don't even know who those people are. Um, so I, I, I guess my, my question comment here is like how did politics become so pragmatic and so divorced from ideology uh, how did this happen because um, you know politics now is about efficiency how many laws can you pass um, how many bills did you get through Congress um, did you do this did you do that I mean it's all focused on action it's not focused on ideas and I think that's we've evolved in a very dangerous direction there towards going away from ideology towards pragmatism um, as you said and then the other comment um, for, for you, Richard, um, had to do with paternalism. And, uh, and actually, no, you something I'll, I'll, I'll switch. Um, w since when did government stop being, uh, since when did the role of government stop being protecting individual rights and, const and, and being constitutionally limited, right? People used to think that those things mattered. Um, and when did it become the government as, uh, supermarket, right? So it's sort of like government and economics have sort of become one in the same thing. You know, healthcare in aisle seven. Oh, you need, um, you know, oh, oh, you need, you need um, 
you know, education, that's an aisle nine. Uh, you know, <laughs> it's, it, it's kind of crazy. It's like, you, you know, it's, they don't see government as performing its original proper function as framed by the founders. They see it as an economy itself now. As, as, as being a hand, you know, as being a handout. Um, and yeah, and so, so anyway, I, you know, I have some comments on paternalism that we can go back to later, but I, I don't want to say too much. David, please, uh, two minutes. David Kelly, you unmute yourself, there you go, good. Uh, okay, um, well, I'd let Jay's, I, I want to address Jay's question because it's a great one. Um, I think the, um, the the reason people don't think in principles anymore has a lot to do with uh, going back into progressive education and the um, partly to some extent the government take over the schools although we've had government public schools for you know going way back into the 19th century but um, the education lobby the um, and bad epistemology bad pedagogy. Um, any more comes out of a um, school of education these days is, is might as well be wearing a sign I can't teach I, I don't know so um, and that was that was a point that Rand made often um, about the um, principles and so one of the she talked a lot about pragmatism which was a huge problem you know during the Johnson and you know that era as well um, I would I want to share something she said because I did, it, it emphasizes the um, the point of why principles are important, not just our our own principles, but ha having people think that way. This is from her uh, article, The Anatomy of Compromise, and I'm quoting: "When opposite basic principles are clearly and openly defined, it works to the advantage of the rational side. When they are not clearly defined but are hidden or abated." it works to the advantage of the irrational side. I think watching politics today is a, a you know, it, it, it's the decisive experiment to prove the truth of what you just said. Um, and the only other thing I, I wanna say, if I have even a couple of minutes, it, it, Jay, um, I was kind of startled in, in your last slide um, about um, changing the political process, about banning lobbying, um, and, you know, public support for elections. I, I mean, I, I have problems with those things in terms of individual rights and, and the rule of law. But I'm also wondering, I, um, instant, I, my, well, my own view, I'll just express it, is that institutional structural changes are not going to make that much difference. People will find ways to work around them one way or another. What we need is to change the philosophy. But I wanted to put yet those two points of yours on the table. Okay. Thank you, David. All right, Richard, uh, please take it away for two minutes. All right, my quick points are, uh, I didn't really end with what would I recommend? And then I realized David Kelly said what I was going to say to recommend, except David's approach is more of the change the philosophy of education, which I totally agree with. Here's my political economic take. I don't see conservatives looking for the privatization of schools. Um, that to me would al allow scope for a better philosophy of education. Right now, you can't get a better philosophy of education because there's no competition. So I don't want to make an overly narrow economic point, but I am shocked really at the at the extent to which for decades now we've heard conservatives and some libertarians uh, complaining about how bad the schools are, but they never come up with, uh, so far as I can tell, plans to completely privatize it. There's the thing on school choice is good, that's a small dent, they used to talk about vouchers. I say go all out and say socialism is a disaster, it's especially a disaster when it's not public ownership of the means of production, but public ownership of the means of instruction. That is killing us, absolutely killing us. So I would get rid of that. Now, David, I agree with you also. I, I was bothered by the lobbying, uh, anti-lobbying ideas of Jay. And I've been working with a theme that says, Jay, Jay, politics, uh, money in politics, to me is totally due to politics and money making. If there was no government involvement in the economy, no one would bother lobbying Washington. So I think we need to reverse the whole thing and say, listen, you still have free speech. Actually, the First Amendment gives us a right, right to um, petition our government for a redress of grievances. That's lobbying. 
There's a right to lobby in the First Amendment. We don't want to lose that. We don't want to lose free speech of people who want to pay for political speech. But the main thing is, I think, we're reversing cause and effect. The reason there's money in politics is there's politics in money making. In other words, the welfare state, the mixed economy. Last thing, David, um, do you know, uh, David, do you notice and others notice when the political uh, talking heads argue with each other? They always say, you're a hypocrite. Last week you were saying this and now you've flipped and the packing the court, it's so ubiquitous that it reminds me of the pragmatism argument. Namely, the reason they're all hypocrites is they have no integrity. They have no fixed principles so they can unendingly and correctly actually accuse each other of hypocrisy. And that's the, the argument from hypocrisy is so, is so lame. It's just so uh, impossible. I'll stop there. All right. Thank you for that. Okay, I'm going to move now to uh, the question and answer session. We have a large number of comments in the chat box, as well as a significant number of questions. Some of them have some overlap. So I'm going to uh, uh, put a couple of questions together for Jay, then also for David, and then uh, Richard will go in that order. Uh, when you answer, this is an impossible uh, request, but if you could keep your answers to uh, two or three minutes, that would be great. Uh, so, so Jay, in the first place, uh, the question is about uh, the role of cognition and emotion and the nativism and learned dimension. So to the extent, for example, that we start pushing on the, the height, the hate analysis, we start emphasizing emotions and people as being emotional, uh, and then we get close to the idea that perhaps these things are innate in people and unalterable. So the question is, do you want to go down that reductionist road to any sort of nativism? And uh, would not uh, an emphasis on the cognitive side of human psychology uh, be, a, be, a, be a better route? And perhaps uh, if we really want to analyze, it's people's predisposition for cognitive effort and cognitive efficacy, that's going to be more predictive of their political outcomes rather than emotionalist starting points. Right, so um, as, as I had mentioned, um, these, gene so you know, you've got evolution that's influencing genetics, genetics that's influencing behavior and thought, so um, sort of the sequential order there. But um, in psychology, you know, it's very rare to find something that is 100% determined. You know, they have yet to identify a gene, to my knowledge, that like 100% explains anything. Um, usually, uh, genes are a starting point. Uh, they push someone in a particular direction, but they, but they allow for a given amount of leeway for environment to kick in and then sort of redirect where somebody goes within that, that sort of uh, bandwidth of, of possible uh, of possibilities. So, you know, um, what we are finding now, it's quite interesting because what we're finding now is that people are doing more and more detailed studies of genetics and they're finding that genetics are playing more of a role than we actually uh, previously thought. Um, so um, I don't want to go down one side or the other. I don't consider myself to be a nativist or an empiricist. I, I believe in both. And as a cognitive psychologist, I certainly believe in cognition. And there's no question that cognition can override emotion, but it takes effort. And um, if you have like a politician who's appealing to innate tendencies, right? They're pulling your strings, so to speak, because they're appealing to your ideas of loyalty and, and you know, and, and um, care and fairness and so forth like that, then they can manipulate you. And I think some of them know that they, can, that they can actually do this. It's actually a lot easier to go straight to the emotions and to appeal to emotions than it is to appeal to reason because reason requires effort Whereas emotions is just something is much just something that's much more of a natural reaction that that uh, that we all have, so I, I'm not I don't mean by any means to suggest that environment doesn't play the role, and I certainly don't mean to suggest that cognition doesn't play play a role. We need cognition, and what we need to in fact we need to reintroduce it. What's missing is cognition. We're sort of regressing back towards a period where. Um, these authoritarians are appealing to these innate tendencies and, and they're pulling our strings and they're jerking us around and they're causing all kinds of problems. So emotions are the problem and cognition is, in my mind, the solution, right? We need to think about, we need, we need to, a la David, we need to know how to reason. Not only do we need to know how to reason, but we need to know, we need to have a proper set of information upon which to reason about. So you need the proper education to give people the concepts, the ideas, 
and then allow them to argue and debate and reason and derive their own conclusions from that. We're missing both in this, in this era, right? I mean, they don't have the proper foundational knowledge in education now, but they also haven't been taught, well, I must say there's a trend towards critical thinking. So there's been some reintroduction in, in terms of like computer programming and reasoning. So there, there's, some, there's some hopefully positive trends towards reintroducing how to think into academia. But um, yeah, so I, I, you know, so that's the, that's the state of affairs. I, I would have to say going forward into the future, we're probably gonna see genetics being playing more and more uh, of a role. Okay, all right, thanks for that. That's, uh, that's uh, very helpful. I've got a few questions I'm packaging to uh, direct to, uh, to David Kelly. Uh, David's solution primarily was education and philosophical education. Uh, uh, one of the questions asked whether there is a, a danger though to philosophical education in terms of supporting a kind of liberalism. On the one hand, uneducated people, they adopt a certain belief system and they can be very uh, fervent and zealous in their approach, but completely ignorant or relatively ignorant with respect to what it is. But that can be very politically effective if combined with tribalism and the various other things. So if our response then is to say, well, we need to have more philosophical education, but then we know philosophical education and liberal fair-mindedness then means you know, considering both or all sides of the argument, and that's going to take a lot of time, and it's going to set people also up for a kind of agnosticism with respect to beliefs, and that undermines people ability, or people's ability rather than to be uh, fire-in-the-belly activists out there. So can you comment to, or on rather the, uh, how a, a proper philosophical education nonetheless will be politically effective? Um, yes, uh, to clarify, um, what I was trying to get across is the importance of an education that teaches you how to think in principles. Now, philosophy, and that's based on a philosophy, but it applies to, uh, I mean, children should be learning uh, principles of science inductively, as you know, would be the ideal. Um, principles of history, or at least understanding the narrative patterns of history. And, um, principles of, of the way our political system works, principles of economics, for sure. And some of these, yes, they're, they're partly controversial. But if you're teaching students the proper use of their conceptual faculty and giving them enough content to you know, prime the pump of their conceptual faculty so that they can then continue um, exercising it on their own, some will go into philosophy I, I, I fully agree that someone who's not fully moored in a, a, a rational view of the world yet should probably not go anywhere near a philosophy department. Uh, uh, yeah, you know, you, you could get sucked into Rousseau or John Rawls or, you know, who knows what, um, a postmodern, a postmodern camp. But, um, I mean, this is kind of ironic to say because as I agree totally with Ren, which you said philosophy is the protector of the sciences and the disciplines and uh, indeed of human rationality. And it's defaulted on that role. But many people are picking it up and doing, uh, I, I, I I'm not going to go where I think we're thinking. I'll, I'll just say most of the noise that we hear on social media and in the streets and are surrounding the election, it does not sound to me like people thinking in principles. It's like Richard was saying, it's uh, politicians. They're flip-flopping and accusing each other of hypocrisy because they don't have any principles. Ironically though, and this has always puzzled me because I'm sometimes shocked about what I hear from uh, people who are still teaching, what it is that students don't know. You know, they can't place the Civil War in the right century. Um, and yet we are seeing young people go to Silicon Valley and do amazing things with artificial intelligence, technology. I mean, just brilliant, brilliant stuff. Um, I wish I had a good explanation for why. Maybe it's the, all the rational people are just going into um, tech because humanities are such a mess. But anyway, 
just to get back to the question, I don't, it's not education in philosophy. It's a philosophically um, appropriate training of the mind. I mean, just as an example, I just, as you guys know, just recently published a new edition of my logic textbook, The Art of Reasoning. That, that teaches principles. It doesn't talk much about philosophy. There's almost no objectives, objectivism in there unless you're looking very knowledgeable and very hard. Mm. Okay. All right. Thanks for that, David. Um, I have a package of questions for, for Richard, and I think I've uh, massaged these, uh, for these quite well. Uh, I was struck by your analogy that, uh, okay. to the train, that uh, economics discipline is really the caboose, and uh, it's pulled by the rest of the intellectual disciplines, of course, uh, philosophy. Uh, the question then uh, is, is that uh, really true? Because if we look at things perhaps sociologically, we still have in our society a vast number of people who are money hungry, and it seems like they will do almost anything in order to get money, including being various uh, unprincipled and, and so forth and suck up to, uh, to governments in order to get to do rent seeking and so on. So economic incentives are not the caboose there, but rather a, a kind of driver. If we're worried about the large number of people who are uh, uh, welfare state recipients uh, and don't seem to be particularly caring, then it seems like, well, you know, kind of basic food in the belly issues, as long as that's looked after, a vast number of people are just going to go along with whatever the government says. And that is to say, it's kind of materialistic economic concerns that's, uh, that really is driving things. And then if we get cynical about your profession and we say lots of economists don't seem to be disinterested or uh, objective truth seekers, but rather they'll come up with theories that they think are going to enable them to get close to the seats of power so that they can uh, you know, pat themselves on the back and, and have a sense that they're doing something. And so you know, economics uh, 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 is driving policy in that particular way as well. So in all of those cases, what would you say uh, kind of in the second stage of development of your thesis that it's not really economic considerations that are that are driving things? That's a really good question. I am I unmuted? Yeah, and that's a really good question. I wasn't saying that people and certain people aren't completely motivated by economics, say, and don't give a damn about politics, say, or moral theory. I was thinking more of what actually moves uh, broad ideas in a culture and then the politics of it and including higher education. And um, uh, the evidence is overwhelming to me. And I, and I must confess that even though I first heard this from objectivism, I don't think I would have noticed it unless I went into academia. And now I really notice it. And it goes something like this. I can talk to an economic student and talk about minimum wage laws and how they cause unemployment and they'll agree and most economists would, but in the end he'll say it's moral. It's, it's just moral to, uh, you know, mandate this wage. And, and so he's in the philosophy department all of a sudden, right? Or um, there, there are many examples I could give of this, so I won't go, I won't go down that route. But I, I, maybe I should leave on a positive note, but also to prove the point that if our problem is uh, intellectual disintegration, you know, the, the fields don't talk to each other and they're in silos, one good um, development over the last uh, 15, 20 years or so are programs called PPE. Now, I'm, I'm in a program at Duke called PPE. I'm, I'm working on it, and I studied that. Now, PPE stands for Philosophy, Politics, and Economics. So even though there are still three separate departments at Duke, for example, politics, you know, economics, and philosophy, there's this separate program, and they have these all over the place. They're in Brown University as of... Uh, Harvard is beginning to do one, UPenn has one, but the idea is you can't study any issue without bringing a philosophic, political, and economic perspective to it. So for example, the, the, the example I used to use with students is, suppose you heard the following statement, we need a fairer tax, we need to enact a fairer tax system. That's actually PP&E. Um, and if you were just an econ student, you wouldn't get it. If you were just a moral philosopher, you wouldn't get it. And if you were just a poli sci major, you wouldn't get it. But the idea is the tax system deals with economics, you know, how it'll affect the economy. Fairer or just is a moral argument. What is egalitarianism? Uh, should there be a flat tax instead of a graduated income tax, right? And the politics of it would be, we need to enact. 
even if you knew this was the moral tax system, and even if you knew it had a good effect on the economy, you still have to know the politics of it. How do you get a coalition to support such an idea? So there, there is an enormous interest from students in these more interdisciplinary PP&E programs, and I think that's a really good sign, but it's still also uh, a very narrow group. It, it's, uh, it's uh, you could say it's cream of the crop, but it's a small select group of students who would wanna do all that to bring all the three disciplines together. But when they do, they're some of the more brilliant students I've ever met. Now, by the way, it doesn't mean they're pro-capitalist. You can be PP&E on the left, you know, care about philosophy and politics and economics and lean in that direction. But I, I'm, I'm for integration, so I'd rather see more integration um, uh, across the board. And there is a movement toward that. These PP&E programs are growing. All right, that's uh, encouraging. Thanks for that. Yeah. All right, uh, we have four minutes left and I was supposed to have five minutes to uh, wrap up and say some, uh, some, some brilliant things, but I'm going to defer on that because there's still some other interesting questions. I've got one question about taxonomy schemes and I'm gonna ask each of you to respond in a minute or a minute and a half on that. So if we then were to say, uh, authoritarianism is a something or other. What is the, the genus of authoritarianism? Is it political system? Is it social political system? But then more importantly, uh, many people are asking, what subspecies of authoritarianism do you think is most defining of our era? So if we're willing to say, you know, there are political systems and then there's authoritarian systems, what kind of authoritarianism are we most dealing with now. Uh, Jay, if you uh, could first. Sure, absolutely. So the way I'm seeing this taxonomy or this hierarchy is that you've got political systems on top. Totalitarianism is typically referred to as the, uh, you know, the more, I know David doesn't like this word, extreme uh, version of, <laughs> of authoritarianism where you sort of lapse from uh, into dictatorship, you know, um, you know, I'd say an authoritarian leader is may not be a complete dictator, but in a totalitarian who has complete control over their over the economy and the decision making and so forth would be um, And the type and as we discussed the sort of subgenus here the, the type that we're dealing with now is the non ideal is the non ideological uh, Authoritarianism which really is about group and the power. It's about the group and about power um, okay. So the ideas have gone, you know, people don't seem to care about ideas anymore. And what we're left with is pragmatism. Um, how do you get elected? How do you aggrandize, you know, self aggrandize and, 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 and controls as much as you can if you're, if you're a politician or a leader. So, okay. um, yeah, so I, I, that's, that's the, the ranking that I would All give. Right, so non-ideological power grab authoritarianism. All right, good, thank you. All right, David, you're up next, if you could, thanks. Um, okay, the, I've just recently spent some time um, trying to create a system of definitions for a lot of key terms in politics and philosophy. Um, I don't, I would not regard it, I, I didn't cover authoritarianism, but one of the, um, I would not consider it an ideology. I think an ideology has to be more intellectually structured with a more definite program for achieving whatever its goals are. Um, and I'm, it, I think authoritarianism as a term is looser than even liberalism or conservatism, much less fascism or, or socialism. Um, but I would say it, it is a, um, it, it, the, the term designates a range a, along a proper political spectrum uh, with that has freedom at one end and totalitarianism at the other. It is uh, a range of things that fall short of totalitarian. Uh, beyond that, it, the way we can divide it, um, there are various other dimensions that distinguish the, what we now call the left or the right in terms of some of the values that we've been talking about. Um, I find it hard to um, think though in terms of a, of a definite subdivision into species of that genus. Um, I, the genus of, of authoritarianism, I would say, is a political, um, uh, a political state, right, or a political system. Um, it's, 
Okay, that's good. All right, so similar to, uh, to Jay's with the non-ideological component, meaning things are very messy all the way through. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Richard, please. Yes, I uh, have a slightly different take than the other two, and this may sound strange, but I think of it as a method. I think it is a way of organizing our life. Who's in authority? Am I the author of my own life? Should I appeal to another author? Uh, is there an author who knows more than me? If they do, should they have power over me? Should I consent to that power or not? Now, that, that'll sound like a much more um, uh, benign view of authoritarianism when we began with, oh my God, it's on the rise, and the next thing we'll know, the Nazis are marching through the streets. I think that's possible, but unlikely in America. I don't think that's likely in America. So that's why I stress so much the paternalist view. So if I were to name, if I were being a taxonomy at all, it would be something like, I see the authoritarianism as this family model, as this infantilism of the electorate. And it's not good and it's very dangerous and we know the way to get out of it, but it's not inevitably gonna lead to Nazism, not inevitably. It's the nationalism and socialism that worry me. But authoritarianism itself, to me, is just a default position for people who can't take care of themselves, and then they want the state to do so. Now, you, we all know that that's a dangerous thing to cede to the state. But I, the benign part of my view of authoritarianism is there are hierarchies and structures and rules by which we live. And that's not a bad thing. It's just when it gets politicized and then coercive. I don't know if that helps. It's not as philosophical as the other answers. Stephen, uh, you're muted. Oh, I pressed it, but it didn't take. Yes, thanks for that, David. Yes, okay, so we are uh, out of time and over time, and we have uh, what they colloquially call the embarrassment of riches, a huge number of comments and questions that we uh, did not get to. So I do want to thank our panelists, all three of you, for extraordinarily rich uh, series of insights and comments. And I know all of this is, a, this is a work in progress. I do want to thank Dr. Vicky Odino for her behind the scenes work. Also to all of you in attendance, thank you for your attendance. Uh, I've jotted down a large number of comments and questions in my own notes here. And let me just say, uh, if you would like more of this, uh, please do support us at the Atlas Society. And along with your support, uh, send in your recommendations for, uh, for further such programs. We'll take all of that seriously and gratefully. All right, I'm gonna sign off for now. Thanks everyone. <laughs>